Did the serpent have legs? That's a question I get all the time. People are asking about that serpent in Genesis chapter three that was influenced by Satan. Did it have legs? That's always a good question. Yeah, we're talking about back to the Garden of Eden, back to that serpent. What was its original appearance? Did it always crawl on its belly or did it have some kind of legs? Was it able to move around? What do you think? Where did this idea even come from? When you look back at the Bible, Genesis chapter three, there's a good description of what's going on when Adam and Eve sin against God. There's a serpent involved. It doesn't actually mention Satan, but Satan is discussed later on in the Bible. That's how we know that Satan was involved in this particular deception. But when we started the Creation Museum, we have an exhibit out here of the serpent. And of course, when we had that, it turned into a firestorm of debate because we had all these different people going, maybe the serpent looked like this, like this. D did it have legs? Did it slither already? You know, in fact, we've got one. This is a model that some of our artists did way back in that day of a potential look at the serpent. You know, you can see this one's kind of got the sprawling legs and it crawls on its belly already. Now here at the Creation Museum, we also have a room. It's called the War Room. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, the reason it's called the War Room is people are battling uh, over different exhibits. The most hotly debated one is what of the serpent. And the reason why people debate on them because there's such precious little info that's actually available. If we go back to that Genesis account, Genesis chapter three, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. What is the serpent related to? What type of beast there? Well, it's compared to the beasts of the field. It makes sense that the serpent itself is actually counted among the beasts of the field. And later on, that's actually a, a state as well down in Genesis 3, 14 is cursed more than the cattle and more than the beasts of the field. Yeah, right. So it, it, it might well have been uh, one of those beasts of the field. The key though is you see the serpent, it's going to crawl on its belly. A lot of commentators think the serpent physically changed forms to be at a lower position. That's possible. That is definitely a, a strong possibility. And I would say the majority of commentators think that's what happened. We do find a handful of commentators to say, oh, not necessarily. Yeah. Maybe the serpent really did slither. And this is basically the Lord just putting him in his place. Yeah. Uh, but either way, something was going on there. Yeah, that Hebrew word there, nakash, which basically is used for serpent, how it's usually interpreted, like you're saying, a lot of those commentators, for example, like Adam Clark, he said, upon thy belly shalt thou go, thou shalt no longer walk erect, but mark the ground equally with thy hands and feet. And even Martin Luther, he even said the too. He said, from this, some obvious conclusions follow that before sin, the serpent was a most beautiful little animal and most pleasing to man as little mules, sheep and puppies today. Moreover, that it walked upright. Most of those commentators, they all believe that the serpent walked upright. Now, of course, we have some exceptions like John Calvin, of course, he believed it was more of a um, more of a symbolic, like put it back into its place, of course, put it in its place, you know, but obviously there's some problems with that. Right, and I, and I would lean against that because if you look at the parallel things going on, look at look at the woman, pain and sorrows and childbearing. Uh, was that beforehand? No, that, that I think is a direct result of their sin. Uh, with Adam, curses the ground because I mean, both thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. Physical into the, changes that were happening. Those yeah. were physical, and, and man would return to dust. We know that wasn't happening prior to sin. So I would suggest, yeah, this, this serpent probably under, yeah. underwent some sort of a change to be at that lower position. Now, did it lose legs or were they simply reduced? Was there a redesign? Like for example, this serpent here, when you look at it with the sprawling legs, it's still crawling on its belly. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a snake. Yeah, like a crocodile, for example, right? Yeah. Or, you know, monitor lizards or all those kinds of things. You know, they can do that and they're still resting on their belly. But a snake, of course, does crawl on its belly. So do legless lizards. There's a handful of instances here, you know, that that would fit that particular description. The problem is when you're looking at it prior to the fall, what did it look like? It comes down to two different things. Really all animals, they either have legs, some kind of appendages that they move around or they slither. Like, like, like a snake, right. for and example. Sometimes so, they'll roll, but they're still using a leg yeah, or a tail yeah, or something. Yeah, still, to, yeah. To and move even them. then, it's like mm -hmm. like a temporary right. thing when they're rolling. So it really comes down to those those two options. And so, yeah. but we have to go back, of course, what does the Bible actually say? What does scripture say? And, and what can we actually take out of scripture? So when it's actually reading it, because if you think about it, um, you know, if it, it was already on its belly, it was already slithering, what was the point of it, right? But Romans chapter 8, verse 22, points out the entire creation is cursed. Uh, you know, every 
everything has, has been touched. Of course, mankind's not directly cursed, but we're living in a sin, cursed, and broken world, so we feel the effects of that, of course. I think we can rule out dinosaurs. I don't think that it was necessarily a, a dinosaur because if, if you look at a dinosaur and the actual definition of a dinosaur, it is a reptilian land creature that has hip structures so that it raises its body up off the ground. So as a result, I don't think the serpent was cursed into something like a dinosaur because its belly does not crawl on the ground. It's actually up above the ground. Dinosaurs are land animals by their technical definition. So they would have been made on day made six on of day creation, six, right. same day as man. So they did live together. Uh, and the, the unique thing about dinosaurs is by and large, we think they've died out there they've gone extinct so yeah. one of the questions i get a lot is was this physical change if it did happen did it happen immediately or was it more gradual over time i've talked to people who believe both the bible simply doesn't tell us you know when it comes to things like thorns and thistles you know if you look at that and study that which people have you know like blackberries can have thorns there's also a thorn thornless variety uh, locust trees some of them have these big huge thorns some have small ones some don't have any i um, you know so i mean you can actually do genetics and kind of breed some of this out uh, i've actually seen palm trees with thorns on it some that don't so you know there's aspects of that where maybe some of it was gradually released some of that information yeah. um, you know the serpent for this to take effect it almost seems like it would have to be a little bit more immediate like Dude, this is gonna happen to you That's, the other question that I get a lot is did the change happen to just that serpent or was it to all serpents? It's a good question too, because you know, if you think about the curse, the curse is affecting all these different animals. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it could have affected a lot of animals in a lot of different ways. What we're told is specifically that one. I mean, the snakes are actually kind of cool. They're kind of neat. I think there's some fascinating aspects to it. So it wouldn't surprise me if some of those actually did exist prior to the fall, but this particular serpent, we don't even know for sure if it became a snake. Uh, you know, there is that possibility. Now I do want to clarify on something. You know, I've had people say, oh, well, Satan was the serpent. Well, I would say it's this way you know the serpent was a real serpent and what it is is satan influenced that serpent it wasn't like satan materialized in the form of a serpent it was an actual serpent because this serpent had an actual physical curse that it had to deal with that doesn't mean satan wasn't involved genesis chapter 3 uh, verses 14 and 15 14 is stated to the physical serpent 15 is stated to satan that uh, his head is going to be uh, crushed even though he's going to bruise uh, the seeds heel satan later in scripture is described as the serpent of old and the great dragon in revelation 20 verse 2 you know and I think there's there's an apt reason for that you know sometimes uh, serpents were seen as pretty vicious creatures throughout the past Satan is mentioned in the Old Testament he's mentioned in Chronicles Job and Zechariah although he's not mentioned directly in Genesis he is alluded to here as well as in Ezekiel he's also alluded so I mean Satan has been involved you know going back to, to his initial sin and then the, the deception of the woman but here's an interesting question who was the seed or the offspring of the serpent ah that's kind of an interesting question people don't look at that one so much let me read you a handful of verses here. Uh, these come from the New King James, Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from this wrath to come? Here's Matthew 12, 34. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here's Matthew 23, 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Repeatedly, we see brood of vipers, brood of vipers, serpents, uh, even in there. And these are the people who kept attacking Christ. And ultimately, they were the ones who sought Jesus to be crucified on the cross. Shouldn't Eve have been shocked that the serpent spoke? I have people, I had somebody ask me that yesterday, actually. I'm like, do you ever have people ask you this question that talking it's talking animals? Shouldn't yeah, it, the, talking the, animals. Who, who believes? You know, that's just ma magical and mythical. Animals yeah. don't speak. Well, you know, my sister in law used to have a blue fronted Amazon parrot, didn't shut up, talked all the time. You're like, what, what, what? And then you realize it's a bird. You're like, oh, yeah. come on. A lot of animals have the phonetic oh, ability. Right, yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Bodie, want a cracker? <laughs> uh, animals can do that in many instances. Now, the thing is, we look at serpents today and they don't really seem to have that phonetic ability. Was that part of the curse? They've lost that sort of thing thing. Uh, either way, this serpent originally had that phonetic ability. Uh, you know, we see, uh, you know, in certain instances, you might think of Balaam's donkey. It had a yeah. chance to speak as well. But, but think of Eve. This is a perfect world. Everything is perfect. She shouldn't have been scared of anything. Everything was new to her as well. Like, wow, this is fascinating. Flip it around. Why would the serpent, this is Satan influencing the serpent. Why would he go after Eve? Yeah, you, you think about that opposite. Basically, it, you're taking that creative order and you're flipping it upside down, mm -hmm. right? So, in the, in the Bible, we see it's essentially God is the authority. Below that is man. And then below man is the dominion over mm -hmm. it, over the creatures mm -hmm. and everything around us. 
And basically, he takes that and flips it around. So the creature deceives the woman, mm -hmm. then disobeys and rebels against high treason, really, against, against, against God. our king, against our God. So yeah. he basically takes that and he reverses the creation order mm -hmm. at that. You know, think of Eve, though. You know, Eve was the last creation. She never saw anything else created by God. You know, so it's interesting, you know, when he goes after Eve, you know, he's going after someone who's not actually experienced seeing God create things. You uh, read that command earlier when the serpent deceived the woman. It was actually very, very clever deception. We sometimes miss it in our English translations. You know, sometimes you look at it, oh, you will, you will not surely die. You just think he's just contradicting God. But if you look carefully at this, when the serpent asked the woman, you know, are you allowed to eat all these trees in the Garden of Eden? Her response was less than perfect. She actually changed it a little yeah, bit. She, yeah. she removed freely eat from any tree. She removed she that. You shall not touch it. You not, shall not touch it. Mm -hmm. um, she even changed God. She Instead of saying Lord God, she switched it to God, which is what the serpent had done. You know, kind of a little little subtle demotion there. But here's the big one. She said, we, we can't even touch it. Otherwise, we will die. And when she said die, she changed the meaning of die. In Hebrew, it's die, die. You put die twice. We don't have that in English. In, in the Latin Vulgate, you do. They have die, die. Um, and it changes the meaning of die. It's more of an ingressive sense. Don't be scary with that. It just means you're going to begin to die and you're ultimately going to die. You're going to start to die. That's what die, die means. Well, she said die once, which means die immediately. So the serpent then comes back, you will not die, die. He's actually quoting the Lord against her. And then she steps back like, oh, yeah, that's what the Lord said. So it's actually a very, very clever deception. Yeah. We sometimes miss that. Yeah. But uh, the serpent had her. And then she stepped back, looked at it, and then followed that progression. Which makes sense because Satan has been a deceiver from the beginning. That's what he does. I, I wrote an entire book, uh, The Fall of Satan. Uh, Rebels in the Gardens, and we, we actually uh, uh, talk a lot about the questions uh, surrounding what happened in the Garden of Eden. We all fall short of that. We all do the exact same thing. We all tend to have our pride that we, we try to bring out. We try to elevate our own thoughts above God's, but, and that's why uh, the cross is so beautiful. That's why the finished work of Jesus is so beautiful. That first messianic promise when he promised to, to defeat death, yes. to conquer death, and that's what he did. He went to that cross 2,000 years ago where he suffered yeah. and died for us. I want people to understand understand the gospel is built on the fall. Jesus Christ stepped into history to save us from sin and death. Adam and Eve's sin brought death into the world. And we all suffer and we all die. And maybe many of you watching this have uh, gone through some sufferings and you know, might have had family members die and you, and you really struggle for answers. That's because we're in a sin, cursed and broken world. Because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we all fell when they fell. But Jesus Christ loved us enough to step into history, to die on the cross, to take the infinite punishment from the infinite Father on our behalf. Because sin must be punished by a perfect God. And Jesus Christ took that punishment upon himself. And that... That is a loving God. And it all goes back to Genesis. Without Genesis, without that foundation, we don't have the gospel at all. So that's why it's so important. We are a biblical authority ministry. We constantly give you answers, but we're also based on Genesis. That is our foundation. That is the foundation for all the doctrine you can think of. For pretty much explicitly or implicitly, every doctrine is based on Genesis. And the most important, of course, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're all about. We love giving answers about, you know, whether the serpent did have legs, did not have legs, who was Satan, what, what was he, blah, blah, blah. But really, it's about the gospel. That's what we are all about. We're about pointing people to Jesus Christ. We're about pointing people to have everlasting life that starts now and lasts forever. They can have their sins washed away as far as the east is from the west, but most of all, to be reconciled to the God that created us, that created you, me, gave us breath in our lungs today. And that's why we're here. If you guys like this type of content, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video. Make sure you comment below as well. And this was another episode off the cuff with Bodie and Rocket Rob. See you guys next time. God bless you all.